morning, everyone. I'd like to bid you a warm welcome as we gather to worship Almighty God and extend that welcome to those who join with us uh, through our online ministry. A couple of announcements. Firstly, a midweek Bible study and prayer meeting this Wednesday evening in Tubermore at 8 p.m. And uh, I'm unable to attend as I'm at another event. And the guest speaker on Wednesday evening will therefore be Dr. Harry uh, Douglas. Uh, Harry has been with you um, in the past, and so he's coming back on Wednesday night to, to study God's Word with you. Uh, next Sunday, then, uh, that'll be the 17th of November, we will mark it as being united appeal sunday for the young people of our congregation that's in in the 16 to, to 30 bracket uh, the um Reverend Moan from Castle Dawson and Curran uh, has sent us an invitation uh, to uh, revive and that will take place on Saturday the 23rd of November at 8pm. Uh, it's a young adults uh, event in Castle Dawson uh, Presbyterian Church. The speaker will be Andrew Moan and the music will be uh, provided by New Dawn. Uh, so if you want further details on that. Uh, just let me know. Uh, and then with regard to this evening, uh, there will be a short act of remembrance at Tubermore War Memorial at 5.40pm, uh, followed by the annual remembrance service in Kilcronachan Parish Church at 6.30pm. Today we take the opportunity to think uh, about uh, God's church and God's people being on a mission uh, and to think about peace, but not only peace between people and between the nations, but peace between people and God. In our call to worship, we read the words of Isaiah chapter 9. They're words that you will often hear read at uh, Christmas time, but words that are very relevant to us as we think about peace. Isaiah chapter 9, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We all desire to find peace. We all desire to know peace. And yet God's word to the prophet Isaiah makes it clear uh, that true and everlasting peace is through knowing Almighty God through faith in Jesus Christ. So let's come to our opening words of praise as found in Mission Praise 660. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Thank you. 
The words of the psalm, the Lord's my shepherd, are familiar and well known to us as we gather and sing in church. Uh, and those same words are familiar to chaplains, to the armed services and to those who serve in the armed forces. As often they meet in buildings or in the open air or under cover of tent uh, to worship Almighty God, seeking uh, to find peace and to know peace. Let's come and pray to Almighty God, the author and the giver of peace. Father God, as we gather in your presence on this Remembrance Sunday, Father, we're gathered in your presence to worship you. You're the one Lord who has created this world and still we're thankful for the remnants of autumn, the leaves that remain and the majestic colours Uh, that surround us at this time and Lord even uh, for the unusual greenness uh, through the milder weather Father we thank you not only for the world that you have created but we thank you and praise you that you're the one who creates all human beings that all human beings are respective of their skin colour, their language or their nation are all created in your image And so, Father, give us a fresh realisation and understanding of who we are. Help us, Lord, to see the needs of others. We pray that you would open our ears that we may hear their cries for those who have no peace, for those who are in need. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts that we indeed would be those who would seek to bring peace in your name and to bring help. Let us not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong. Lord, open our eyes and our ears that we may be those who will do a work of peace for you. We pray, Lord God, that in our lives that you indeed would help the fruit of the Spirit to grow. We pray, Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit would grow in our families and in our nation. And so we pray for peace on earth. We pray, Lord, for love between enemies. We pray for patience amongst the nations. And Father, we know that at this point in history, there is much turmoil. There are many lands and many people who do not know peace. There are indeed many who have become enemies. And so we pray, Lord God, that peace may once again reign. Lord God, we thank you for the peace that we enjoy. We pray, Father, that you indeed would help us to protect and care for the liberties that have been stowed upon us. That we, Lord God, would respect and encourage the authority of government. And Father, that we may know the spirit of wisdom so that there may be justice and peace in our land. Lord, as we pray for others, as we pray for our nation, we pray, Father, that individually we would know peace with you through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone as our Lord and Saviour. And this we pray in his name. Amen. I think I heard voices. I I want to share with the the boys and girls and the the young people about peace, about people looking for peace. Sometimes you will hear people, whether young or older, talking about inner peace. They talk about how to calm themselves down, how to cope with anxiety or anxiety or how to cope with fears and how they want to enjoy peace and quiet and silence. Maybe the boys and girls and young people think more about peace between each other in school. Making and keeping friends, sorting out arguments, how to give and take 
and how to let go of bad feelings about someone else. Or maybe you think about how you build bridges and build connections. Or maybe you think about how to listen to the other person in the playground or in the classroom, even though you don't agree with them. And all of that goes for us, whatever age we are in life. We have to think about how to respect differences, how to listen and be able to talk with those who hold the same or particularly different views. This weekend we'll think about peace in our world and as the young people look at television and news reports, they will see, as we see, history unfolding before our eyes. We will see nations and increasingly more nations at war. But there will be those who are working for peace. There are peacekeepers. There are those who are encouraging countries and nations to, to talk and to give and to take and to find peace. So that wars may cease and people may be able to live, have their homes, have their jobs and to enjoy this world. Indeed, the Bible says God blesses those who make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so boys and girls and young people, it's good for us to want to make peace. Maybe sometimes in our home, it's a matter of making peace with our brother or sister. Maybe sometimes it's a matter of trying to make or keep peace at school or at college. But God wants us to find and to work for peace. And in a world, I'll not ask you for, for symbols today, but I'll get you to think that in our world there are symbols for peace. There are symbols that have come from different places, including the Bible, that remind us about peace. We have the picture of a bird called a dove. Many people think of that meaning peace. Or we have got the picture of an olive branch. And people think of an olive branch and peace. It's good for us to think today and this Remembrance Weekend about peace. To think about peace treaties, pieces of paper, agreements being signed about weapons being laid away, about people shaking hands, about nations coming together. And one of, the, one of the symbols we may find of that is thinking about a calm water, a calm lake, and how that reminds us of peace, just as we are singing about the Lord's my shepherd and how he leads me beside the quiet waters. So let us think about peace. And indeed, not just now, but as we move into December, we'll be thinking about Christmas. We'll be thinking about the birth of Jesus. We'll be thinking about the manger and the words that the angels spoke. Peace on earth. And so we'll continue to think about peace. We'll continue to think about Jesus and how he can bring to us everlasting peace so watch out for doves watch out for the olive tree or the olive branch watch out for those different symbols that remind us of peace now we're going to turn to our next hymn it's mission praise 143 and after all the talk about peace we're, we're going to sing about fight the good fight uh, and this is a, a battle, a fight, a struggle that we have to fight against sin so that we will live with Christ and be at peace with him. Mission Praise 143, fight the good fight with all thy might.
being Remembrance Sunday, we're going to have a short act of remembrance. And so, uh, just as you've been able to sit down, we ask you, uh, if you're able to stand, to to stand with us uh, for this uh, short act of remembrance. Let's stand. Today we gather to remember those who gave their lives and those who served in two world wars and in subsequent conflicts around our world, including the troubles of our own land. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. We will remember them and remain standing for the silence. When you go home, tell them of us and say, For your tomorrow we gave our today. Let's pray. Ever living and loving God, as we gather, we remember that there is still suffering in our world today, suffering due to sin. Father, that sin. Is reflected in how nation has risen against nation, not just now, but in the past. Father, how there is suffering because of the faith that people proclaim. There is suffering for those who in certain countries proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, Father, As we reflect and remember in the peace and in the quiet, we thank you for those who have died in the defence of their country. Father, we thank you for those who have given up their lives in the sharing of the gospel. Lord God, we want to thank you for the freedoms that we have inherited from the sacrifice of a previous generation. Help us, Father, to respect and uphold them realizing the sacrifice that was paid for our benefit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to turn in our Bibles to read from Acts chapter 13. We often, as we watch the movies, um, particularly from the wartime, think about the soldiers and how they were sent on a mission. They were given a mission to capture a bridge. They were given a mission to, to, to free some prisoners, whatever it may be. And so here today we're going to be reading uh, about how the church sent Barnabas and Saul off on a mission, a mission to share the gospel, a mission to bring peace uh, to other people. Acts chapter 13 from verse 1 through to verse 12. In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lysias of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, 
the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met the Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul and intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Amen. And may God bless this reading of his holy word. Let's now come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we bow before you and we thank you for the blessings that you have granted to us. The blessings, Lord, that we immediately think of, of health and of strength. The gift of a new day and breath to breathe. Lord, we want to thank you that we are able to reflect our love and gratitude to you through our offering. And we pray for your blessing to be added to it. And Father, we want to give you thanks for those who work for peace. Your word reminds us that the peacemakers are blessed by you. And so, Father, we thank you for all of the different discussions that are going on, both public and private. Father, we pray for the discussions regarding Israel and Gaza, that they may bear fruit, that prisoners may be released, that peace may come upon that region. And Father, we pray for Ukraine and Russia for that hostility to end and for the people of both countries to once again know peace and normality. Lord God, we commend to you today King Charles III. We commend to you the royal family and pray that they may know your blessing and they may know peace with you, just as we pray that each of us may know peace with you through faith in Jesus. Lord, we pray for this, our generation, that they may have a desire to be peacemakers rather than war makers. We pray, Lord God, for stable government in countries around our world. We pray, Lord God, for acceptance and accommodation of different religions and faiths in countries, particularly where Christianity is a minority, places like India, North Korea, China, and Iran. Lord, we pray that we, in some small way, may be able to help to bring peace and stability in our time at home and abroad. And so today we ask for a blessing upon the members of the armed forces spread across the globe in various responsibilities. We give you thanks for ex-service men and women. We pray that they may continue to know health and strength, that they may be able to share their wisdom, and indeed, Lord, that they, they may be able to share their memories, to be able to alert others, to the danger and to the pain and the turmoil that comes with war. Lord God, we commend to you our chaplains, those who serve amongst the armed forces around the world. We pray, Lord, that you would guide them as they lead worship. Father, that they may be able 
to teach and to explain how those soldiers and service people may have peace with Christ as they seek to bring peace between peoples and indeed protect the peace that already exists. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing again as we turn to Mission Praise 446 with the words, Lord, thy word abideth. As we come to this uh, 13th chapter of the book of Acts in our, in our studies uh, through this book, we discover that we have here the account of the missionary call of two men, Barnabas and Saul. This chapter is a turning point in the book of Acts, which marks the beginning of the third phase of the Lord's Great Commission. As they ministered to the Lord, we're told, as they ministered to the Lord. This was part of what happened in the congregation in Antioch. Barnabas and others ministered to the congregation. And the congregation also ministered uh, to one another. And yet they also ministered to the Lord. This is the first job of any servant of God, to minister unto the Lord. There's often a bit of debate goes on as to who the minister is accountable or answerable to. But these verses are a reminder to us that the minister is firstly answerable to Almighty God. And doing this it's reflecting the teaching of Paul in Romans 12, 
that they did the service of priests under the New Testament. They were offering their bodies as living sacrifices. Their ministering to the Lord means doing what pleases him and what honours God. Worship, praise, prayer, listening to and honouring God. Back in chapter 1 of this book, before Jesus ascended into the heavens, he said to the disciples that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses for me. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus outlined geographically how the witnesses should proceed, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea, and then Samaria, and then out to the uttermost parts of the world. There was a geographical vision. There was a mapping out of where the gospel was to spread. And the last phase, the last phase of that great commission coincides with the beginning of the apostleship of Paul. His conversion had come 11 or 12 years earlier. And the laying of hands, as we recorded here in chapter 13, was a formal commissioning of his work. Certainly Barnabas and Saul and were ordained before this, but now they were entering a different sphere of ministry. Notice that it's a church at Antioch, the church at Antioch, where Barnabas and Saul were being sent out and were being sent from. They were being supported by a specific congregation. And as far as we know, as we read through the book of Acts, this had never happened before in the history of the church, where a church had sent out missionaries. Yes, individuals had gone uh, to preach the word and to spread the good news, but this was, this was different. The church at Antioch were sending these two men. Being intentional. They were sent by the church. And many regard this as being the first real known missionary effort of the church of Jesus Christ. Indeed, the word missionary has to do with sending, if we go back to the Latin basis of it, the Latin word mito means to send, means mission, missionary, coming from the various forms missi and missum. And here we're learning today how the Holy Spirit led and guided his church and guided his people. The first three verses, will they relate to the setting for the call of the Holy Spirit? How, how they were meeting together, how they were ministering, as we said. But it's interesting as well to note who was there in that gathering. There were prophets and there were teachers. There was Barnabas. There was Simeon, who was called Niger. There was Lucius, Serene. There was Manian, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. There, there were people who may not realize were, were quite diverse and quite different. And so this church at Antioch was able to live at peace with one another. They were able to deal with the differences that they encountered. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I have called them. And so the whole event begins with a group of Christians meeting in the church in Antioch. They're exercising the spiritual gifts that God had given to them. The first three are prophets, Barnabas, Simeon, and Lucius. Barnabas, whom we know and have met before, Barnabas the encourager. And so that's helpful in making peace to encourage others. Simeon, who is called Niger. Uh, and that appears to be a reference to the area of Africa that is now known to us as Nigeria. And indicates that perhaps this man was black. He was a different skin colour from others in the church. And Lucius of Serene. Well, he also came from North Africa. 
You may have met this man, Simeon, in the Gospels, as the one who is impressed by the Romans to bear the cross of Jesus while he was on the way to crucifixion. It may very well be the same man, but we're not 100% sure. Then there are two teachers, Manan, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch. This is not the Herod we met in the previous chapter 12, whose death is recorded, but this Herod is the one under whom our Lord suffered and before whom he appeared. And again, the Greek text makes clear this man, Manan, was a foster brother of Herod. He was related to him as a foster brother and thus very close to the king. So you see there again, we have different personalities, different upbringing, different social status, different connections, possibly slightly different points of view. Here's a collection of people from all walks of life who made up the church. And they were busy worshipping God together. They were at peace in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they were busy employing their gifts whenever this call of the Spirit came. Now, some people would say that you can steer a ship or turn a car more easily whenever it's moving. It's much more difficult if you get into the car and just try to steer the car or turn the wheels whenever it's static. I don't know how it works on a ship that is not moving. But the principle, no doubt, is something similar. It's easier to turn and to steer whenever you've got movement, where you've got momentum. And so it's believed that it was easier for Barnabas and Saul and for the church because they were doing what God had planned for them. And they were being steered in the right direction. And God loves to see people at the work he has called them to do. God loves to see his people going about their worship, going about exercising the spur, their, their gifts, and then he guides and directs them to where they're to serve him. So he chose the men and he chose the work. And so he said to the church, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to do. They've been set aside for a purpose. And possibly uh, as we go through these verses, one thing that ought to be commented on here is the fact that they were all fasting, as we see in verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they then went on to lay hands on these two individuals. In the modern church, fasting is something that has largely disappeared and yet it appears to have been very helpful and it was a very much needed expression of spiritual awareness and deep spiritual concern as reflected here as these people were prepared to go on mission. The whole church recognised and identified with these two men as they were sent out. And then after fasting and after praying, the hands were laid on them and they were sent off. The whole church was involved, one body acting together to indicate to these men that they would go with the support and the encouragement and the prayers of the church. That they would be provided with the financial resources to fulfill the ministry that God by his spirit had called them to. And so they sent them out with this expression of harmony, of unity, with the whole church behind them. There was that peacefulness, there was that still water picture of the church preparing for this great change in its life. And so we have before us a wonderful picture of the blending together of the sovereignty of the spirit and the responsibility of the people in the church and those who are willing to respond to the instructions of God. Verses 4 to 5 give us this guidance. We discovered that these men were being sent out by the Holy Spirit. 
And so God was at work guiding Barnabas and Saul. And they went down firstly to Cilicia. And from there they sailed to the place called Cyprus, the island. A place we associate with holidays and sunshine and high temperatures. The Christians of the church at Antioch, St. Barnabas and Saul, but more importantly, the Holy Spirit sent these two people. Any group of Christians, any church can send someone on a mission project. They can send them on a missionary exercise. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't send them, it won't amount to effective eternal ministry. And before us in these verses we have a blending together of two factors. God's sovereign authoritative choice and man's necessity to choose within a more limited area. There is the first descending out of these two men. The Holy Spirit laid on their hearts, placed a call upon them to go to share the good news to go and talk about peace with Jesus Christ. To share about the forgiveness of sins. It was the Spirit who encouraged them to move out in response to a geographical commission that Jesus had given. But the men decided where to go. And that's perfectly proper. When they thought over the situation... They decided Cyprus would be a logical place to sail to. They didn't wait for the Holy Spirit to point it out on a map. They no doubt prayed about it. But based on the practicalities of sailing, based on their practical connections and relationships on the island, they made for Cyprus. Because Barnabas was originally from Cyprus. And so were the men who started the church at this place called Antioch. But they went with confidence. And they went believing that this was God's choice. They were also that when they arrived there, they went in verse 5 to preach the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. The, the letter of Paul to the Romans reveals to us that the gospel was first to go to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so Paul believed very much in going first to the synagogue, going first to preach to the Jews. So it's not your that they went to the synagogues on Cyprus. There again we have a combination of natural reason and specific and precise command of the Holy Spirit and Paul always appears in his writings and his mission journeys to obey this pattern he went to the Jews and when they rejected the message he went to the Gentiles as Paul and Barnabas went they took with them a young man called John Mark now Mark we understand was not commanded of the Lord to go with them but Saul and Barnabas took him here again there's an human element they went to Cyprus they landed at Salamis they began to preach and obviously they expected God to be with them they expected to see fruit for their labours and doors to open just as we are to expect to see God move in our lives, God move in our community, doors to open and the word of God to be spread and that is the way the Holy Spirit worked then. That is the way that the Holy Spirit commonly operates today. No one has to wait. No one is to wait for orders covering everything that they do. There is a place for the leading of the Spirit. And there is a place for us following the understanding that God has given to us. The Holy Spirit had a plan. The Holy Spirit had a strategy and had a purpose. The Holy Spirit wanted the people in each city, in each country, in each nation to hear the good news so that they could live at peace not only with one another but peace with Almighty God. 
Remember, uh, as uh, Barnabas and Saul set off, they were setting off into a Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was renowned uh, to be an empire of great peace. One once that they had captured a country, they set up the infrastructure, they governed over it, uh, uh, and uh, there was great safety and protection. And therefore, the ease of movement and transport throughout the empire was free-flowing. And people would have known what it was to be at peace. And they would have enjoyed peace. They would have enjoyed still waters. And so this message that Saul and Barnabas brought of peace with God would have resonated and would have meant something to them. So Paul uh, and Barnabas, they had a very effective ministry. The churches had been established in Cyprus right from the beginning of the, the preaching of the word. But only one incident in Cyprus is recorded for us. And Luke tells us that Paul and Barnabas passed through the island from the east to the west. And they finally arrived at a place called Paphos the capital of the island on the western shore. And there something unusual happened. There, there was a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, who went under the name Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. He was a man, Sergius Paulus was a man of intelligence, a man of authority, and he summoned Barnabas and Paul. He wanted to hear the word of God. And sometimes we drop into those conversations. We discover people coming to us asking about the gospel. They want to hear how they can be at peace with Jesus. But there was this man called Elimus. He was a magician. He was a sorcerer. And he wanted to come between the ruler and the messengers. He wanted to protect the proconsul as such. He didn't want him to hear this message of peace with Jesus. Now, no doubt Paul and Barnabas had no idea that they would be invited to the governor of the island to share their message. But the man prompted by the Holy Spirit, being a pagan, a pagan Roman, he wanted to hear the words of truth for himself. And so Paul and Barnabas came to preach and to share with the governor. But as Elimus opposed them, his name bar Jesus, it gives us a hint of what this man was doing. Bar Jesus means the son of Jesus. When this man therefore called himself Bar Jesus, he was claiming that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But what he was teaching was absolutely contrary to what Jesus taught. Bar Jesus was a false teacher. He wasn't interested in the thing of Jesus, or he wasn't interested in the message of Jesus, but he's interested in what he could get for himself. And so he was greatly provoked, or he greatly provoked the spirit of Paul by pretending to be a follower of Jesus. And Paul says there could be nothing further from the truth. You're teaching something that's contrary. You're teaching something that opposes Jesus. And Paul was deeply disturbed by this man. And so Paul didn't shy away from him. He, he didn't dismiss him lightly but he confronted him he confronted him in a tactful and a courteous way he says you son of the devil you enemy of all righteousness full of deceit and villainy you'd better stop what you're doing perverting the straight paths of the Lord and then Paul told him that he would be blind, that he wouldn't be able to see, and immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about groping, trying to, to seek the people around him to give him a helping hand. And so the proconsul, when he saw what had happened, he believed, 
And he was astonished at the message that Paul and Barnabas brought about the Lord. One of the other reasons why this passage or this event is recorded for us by Luke is that it's here that Paul, or Saul as we knew him, becomes Paul the Apostle. It's here that Paul began to exercise his apostleship. For the first time, and filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to act as an apostle. It is the first of those signs of an apostle which Paul would tremendously fulfill to indicate that he was indeed truly selected by the Lord Jesus to be a founder of the church. And here he speaks with the same authority that Peter spoke to Ananias and Sapphira. Whenever they tried to fraud the church, whenever they pretended to be something that they weren't in the fifth chapter, they too experienced an immediate judgment. And it's only the apostles were ever given the power to act in judgment like this. And so here Paul becomes an apostle. And immediately as you read through this book from here on, you discover that the leadership shifts from Barnabas to Paul. From here on, it is no longer Barnabas and Saul. It is Paul and Barnabas. And that's confirmed uh, later as we'll discover in verse 13. And how they then continued on their missionary journey seeking to bring peace Peace between the people and Jesus Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this record of your church and how people were led, guided and directed by your Holy Spirit. How they were supported by the church, how the good news was received and also, Lord, how it was rejected and how your church Grew. And so we pray today, Lord, that we too may be those who gather together to worship you, that we may be a church that send others with the good news to different countries, that we, Lord God, may be those who pray and who care and who see your church grow at home and abroad. Amen. So as we seek for guidance, we turn to the words of Mission Praise uh, 201 to sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And after we sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, I pronounce the benediction and then we remain standing for the first verse of the National Anthem. Let's praise God.
now may the Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace, and indeed the work of mission. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>